So we've discussed a whole lot about the electrical activity of the heart and how these signals are actually sent and communicated throughout the heart. Let us now go back to the mechanical effects and what this all means in terms of the heart's activity. The first thing I want to do is just separate the heart's activity into two main stages. So these are called systole and diastole. So systole refers to the heart when it is in contraction. This is when it's tensed, it's pushing that blood. The diastole is when the heart is relaxed. This is more so the filling stage. Now in terms of our systole and diastole, these comprise the cardiac cycle. Now what the cardiac cycle describes is the complete contraction and the complete relaxation of all four chambers. Now, when we're looking at our cardiac cycle, there are two main variables that we can look at here. The first sort of couple are our end diastolic volume or our end systolic volume. So our end diastolic volume refers to the amount of blood that is still in the ventricle at the end of diastole. So this is at the end of the big filling stage when we're pushing blood into the heart. Now at the end systolic volume, this is the amount of blood that is left over at the end of that constriction of the heart. Now something that's important to keep in mind here is that we can, you know, if we can fit a, say 130 mil of blood into the ventricle, that does not mean that 130 mil of blood is going to be leaving. We do not remove like every single last drop of the of blood from our ventricle every single heartbeat. Uh, there's just no point. It's it's a waste of energy, especially say someone in my situation right now. I'm sitting at my uh, at my office desk, nice and, and comfortable. My body is not under any sort of physical strain. It's not like I'm running for my life or something like that. So I do not need to be forcefully ejecting every single drop of blood from my ventricle every single cycle. There's no need. Now, the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume combined give us our stroke volume. And stroke volume is incredibly important. And what stroke volume does is it tells us the amount of blood that is leaving the heart per cycle. And that's very important. How we can calculate that is that we take our end diastolic volume, so how much blood is in the ventricle, and we subtract the end systolic volume, so how much was left over. And that will tell us the amount of blood that has left the ventricle per cycle. Now, within our cardiac cycle, we then have cardiac output. Please be careful here. Do not confuse cardiac cycle with cardiac output. They are two very different things. The cardiac cycle is what happens per cycle, so per heartbeat, okay? It is one heartbeat, essentially. Cardiac output tells us the amount of blood that is being ejected from the aorta or pulmonary, um, pulmonary trunk per minute, okay? So it is the amount of blood ejected from the heart per minute. So how do we calculate that? Well, we know that stroke volume is our end diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume. So what our stroke volume is telling us is the amount of blood leaving the heart per beat. So if we multiply that by our heart rate, then we know the amount of blood that is leaving the heart per minute because we then multiply how many times our heart is beating per minute. So if we have a 70 mil of volume being our stroke volume and our heart is beating at 75 beats per minute, then we do the math and that gives us 5.25 liters of blood being pushed out of our heart per minute. Now, this stroke volume, in the same way in our, as our heart rate, is never just static. It never is just, it's always 70 mil no matter what. No, it does change. And there are several factors that go into controlling our stroke volume. So in terms of stroke volume, there are three main factors that control how much blood is ejected from the heart per cardiac cycle. The first one I wanna discuss is called preload. So what preload is, it's the amount of stretch that our cardiac muscles are feeling in terms of those um, atria and in terms of those ventricles. And this is a law that's called the Frank Starling law. And how I want you to really visualize this in your mind is like a bow and arrow. So if I take a bow and arrow and I just pull it back a little bit and then let it go, the arrow's not going to shoot very far. 
However, if I stretch the arrow right back as far as it'll go and then let go of the arrow, the arrow is going to launch way further. I want you to take that same logic and apply that to reload. The more blood that is being filled in the heart and the more that these atria and ventricles are stretching, the harder they're going to constrict and push even more blood out. And this is particularly important if I, again, start running for my life, okay? I'm going to need to put more blood into my heart to stretch it more so it can squeeze more and push more blood out to increase my circulation to make sure that more blood is being delivered to my tissues. The, the second one I want to talk about, which should hopefully be common sense, is contractility. If our heart squeezes harder, more blood will leave the heart and we will have an increase in stroke volume. This is also why those people who have um, chronic hypertension will be prescribed things like calcium channel blockers because calcium increases that contractility, makes the heart squeeze more. Now, these first two, preload and contractility, are pretty straightforward, okay? As preload goes up, stroke volume goes up. As contractility goes up, stroke volume goes up. Afterload is the opposite. As afterload goes up, stroke volume goes down. So what is afterload? What is important to keep in mind here is that as the blood is leaving the heart, whether it be through the pulmonary trunk or out through the aorta, these vessels here aren't empty. They have blood in them as well. So what afterload describes is the amount of pressure that is inside these vessels here. Now, if we have someone who does have very high blood pressure, there is a lot of pressure in there, which means that we need to squeeze even harder to really push and move that blood through. Another thing too is say viscosity. So how thick is your blood? So let's say I pull out my magic wand and I say, boom, your blood is now honey. I've turned your blood into honey. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend it. Um, what is happening here? Honey is obviously very viscous. So it means that the heart has to work way, 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 way harder to push that honey through because it's so viscous. So now we've looked at the electrical conductivity of the heart and we've looked at sort of the more mechanical activities of the heart in terms of cardiac output and stroke volume and the cardiac cycle. Let's look a little bit into the nervous and hormonal control of the heart. So what is important here is that throughout our body, we have baroreceptors. Now what baroreceptors are, are a form of mechanoreceptors. And how I want you to uh, really interpret that is that these baroreceptors or these mechanoreceptors are measuring the degree of pressure or the degree of force that is being exerted. So for instance, if we have our aortic arch here and we are measuring the, the amount of force, the amount of stretch that's being applied to our aortic arch isn't that high, okay? The, our receptor's going, hey, well, hang on, it, it should be pushing a lot more on here and it's not. I think our blood pressure is, is a bit low. And what that can do is that a signal will then be sent up to the cardio accelerator center and basically say, hey, excuse me, uh, blood pressure is getting a bit low here. I think we need to kick this up a notch. And then signals can be sent down to the heart to increase that heart rate or increase that contractility to increase our blood pressure. Another thing too is that we also have chemoreceptors. So chemo means chemical. And these can detect changes in various chemical stimuli, things like oxygen saturation, things like pH. So is your blood getting more acidic? Things like carbon dioxide, okay? And basically if your if these receptors are going, hey, we have less oxygen, we have way more CO2, and our blood is getting more acidic, hey, well, we need to increase our heart rate, we need to increase our stroke volume, and we need to increase our cardiac output because what this is telling us is that we're not getting enough blood to our tissues. So big things we need to keep in mind here is that if we are looking at sympathetic stimulation, that's going to increase our heart rate, whereas parasympathetic is going to decrease it. And it is a constantly changing thing in terms of your heart rate, in terms of your blood pressure, in terms of heart contractility and cardiac output and stroke volume and all of these other lovely uh, parameters are always changing. 
depending on your body's needs. You are not going to have a heart rate of 180 with blood pressure of 180 over 100 while lying in bed about to go to sleep. At least I hope not. If you do, you might want to talk to someone because that is not good. <laughs> so whereas if I'm out running for my life at a dead sprint, then yeah, we really need to dial that uh, dial it up to really make sure that I'm able to survive. Now, what we just discussed there was more so the nervous system control of the heart. We also have hormonal control of the heart, which I'm going to describe very briefly, because I'm going to talk about this um, a little bit later on in the course. But there are various hormonal controls that we have to either increase contractility or increase that heart rate or decrease it. So a perfect example is like, say, I'm running for my life. I have a massive surge of adrenaline. That massive surge of adrenaline will really increase that heart rate, will increase that contractility. So I really feel my heart sort of beating in my chest. We can also have other medication like pharmaceutical medication, things like digoxin. And what that does is it reduces the amount of sodium that's able to sort of move into the cell, which by reducing sodium, it also reduces calcium, which can reduce our, our heart rate. And again, this will be covered in, in many other aspects of your, of your studies. So please just be aware that, you know, not only do we have a nervous control of our heart rate and, and blood pressure, we also have a, a hormonal control as well.